Josh Brown, Team Ninja's latest masterpiece is due in the rounds Rise of the Ronin. At the time we record this, we don't even know what kind of review scores it's going to get, but we're both enjoying it. We absolutely are. And I only know what review score it got from me, Scott Telford. That was a <laughs> lovely four out of five. I have absolutely adored my time with this game. I smashed through 60 hours of it in a little over a week. And even when I've moved on to other major releases like Dragon's Dogma 2, I still go back to Ronin for a hit <laughs> for because the feel. it just is that good in terms of its combat and game feel. With that in mind, I'm Scott. I'm Josh. And this is Rise of the Ronin, 14 tips and tricks the game doesn't tell you. Number 14, you have way more combat styles than you may realize. So one of the major mechanics in Rise of the Ronin is switching between different combat styles depending on the enemy you're facing. If you have an advantage against the enemy, that will be signified by a lovely little blue arrow above their heads. And if you're at a disadvantage, it'll be a downward facing red arrow. So you're kind of having to change on the fly in combat to make the most of your attacks and mm -hmm. make sure you're actually doing both key damage and health damage against the enemy. Now, all of this is explained very early on in Rise of the Ronin, and you have three different slots for your different combat styles. Now, the thing that is kind of um, a little bit confusing the more you go on is that you're getting so many more combat styles and fighting styles for each weapon than you may realize. And it wasn't until I went into the menu itself and actually realized I had, in some cases, four, five, six different combat combat styles per weapon that I was missing out on different movesets and more importantly, better damage and better stats because you have within each weapon type specific styles, like you might have one called Jin combat, for okay. instance, um, and that will do a specific type of damage to specific enemies depending on their weapon, but you can have multiple other versions of the Jin fighting style that might do a little bit more damage, that might be a little bit more advanced, and the more you use those fighting styles, the more you level them up, and it's worth constantly checking because you might be using a combat style that, yes, gives you an advantage against certain enemies, but there might be another version of that with more hmm. interesting special moves and outright higher stats. I do find that the way Rise of the Ronin throws you in, uh, I didn't know that whatsoever. I've only been playing for a couple hours, um, but that's worth noting down. Number 13, checkpoints after defeating sub-bosses in bandit camps. The checkpoints in Rise of the Ronin might be a little bit confusing to you if you are coming from previous Team Ninja mm. games, which are way more indebted to the Souls-like formula of having bonfires where enemies respawn, and you're kind of doing bonfire runs from checkpoint to checkpoint. These return in the form of veiled edged banners in Rise of the Ronin, and yes, they do respawn enemies, but I think it's interesting to note that there are way more checkpoints in this game than just those bonfire style locations. Okay. Instead, for instance, if you're taking on a bandit camp where you have to liberate X amount of enemies before you clear the entire area, you'll actually get checkpoints even if you get killed mid activity, mm. but it'll only checkpoint after you've killed one of the sub bosses. So to clear out a bandit camp, you need to clear out all of the enemies. And that usually includes one, two, three, maybe even four more powerful enemies. And every time you kill one of those, it actually sets a checkpoint of progression. So if if you die after that, you'll always be going back into that activity with that guy banked and usually right. at least a couple of regular enemies banked as well. So you can kind of force your own checkpoints into those activities in an interesting way where you're not losing all of that progress. So if you went through one of these camps and killed, say, seven regular enemies, that wouldn't be banked. Mm -hmm. But if you killed those seven regular enemies and then you killed one of the sub bosses, it it would bank everything you've done. Cool. And you can can you reload that checkpoint bigger enemy save, or is it still just the flag saves that are actual resuming the game saves? No, that's an interesting point because sometimes these bandit camps, for instance, will have one of those flags that mm. works as a bonfire, but sometimes it won't. So it'll just spawn you outside of the combat area and you can just literally jump back in in stealth or just go in full whack with your swords and your bayonets and whatnot. And the big dudes will stay dead. And the big dudes will all always stay dead. 
Number 12, change your title for stat boosts. This is something that confused me for hours <laughs> in this game, Scott Telford, because uh, as you play and the more you complete side missions and do specific requests for specific people or unlock challenges within the open world, you might notice that you're getting what's referred to as new titles for your actions. So you might be known as like a bounty master or the top cat petter in the entire <laughs> realm or something like that, but yeah, it's yeah. quite hard to find them. And it's because this entire feature is sort of hidden within a subset of the menu. So if you go into the menu and you go into your character status screen, you can actually click R3 to alter your title. Right. And not only does this change how your avatar is seen when they appear in someone else's game in, the, in what they're referred to as, but it actually can give you individual stat boosts mm -hmm. as well. It's important to note that there are stat buffs associated with these titles. So it's always worth checking when you get a new one because you might be able to buff your strength by two or buff your oh, charisma yeah. by one and it's something that you know the game prompts you to look at but you might not notice the significance mm. of it until you find it within this sub menu i certainly didn't anyway totally fair Number 11, ranged attacks for bosses can be OP. Scott Telford, you know when you're playing a Souls type game, yes. you know there's always that kind of boss etiquette that you can get into where you think, no, I need to fight this boss on their own need terms. To have honor. I need to have honor. I need to prove my metal against them. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, in Rise of the Ronin, you don't need to do that at all <laughs> because standing back against a boss and using, say, a bow and arrow or one of your rifles can absolutely absolutely coming clutch for those last gasp efforts. And this won't be for everyone because a lot of people do like going one on one, mm -hmm. but it's important to note, I think that using the ranged weapons on bosses, whether you're one V one and have a bit of space or if they're aggroed by other players or AI allies, you can do a lot of damage both to their health and both to their key. One of the best ways to approach, I think bosses in just fights generally in rise of the Ronin is to start every attack with an assassination or a critical mm -hmm. move. If you do that to bosses, you can usually knock off half of their health, but obviously in some situations, you don't get the drop on bosses, but while you're waiting for them to close you down, you can whip out your rifle and hit them with seven headshots, <laughs> and that will do an immense amount of damage. It might even stagger them as well, mm -hmm. knock them over, so then you can run in and get a finishing move on them. Even on the hardest difficulty, I found this an incredible tactic if you're a little bit overwhelmed by a boss. And look, there's no shame in doing it now and again. <laughs> We've all had to cheese a boss here and there. Sometimes they just deserve it. Just put a blunderbuss to the mush. That's all you need. <laughs> Number 10, pick up everything. I am a hoarder in video games, Same. Scott Tilford. Even in titles where you get easily over encumbered, I will loot everything. I will steal everything. I will pick <laughs> up anything that isn't nailed down. And sometimes that's a bad move because a lot of games, especially RPGs, especially titles cribbing from from soft where style titles um, will lumber you with drawbacks for that. Mm -hmm. You might become over encumbered and even if you're not, carrying a lot of stuff will add weight to your character, meaning you can't be as agile, can't mm -hmm. move as fast, have less stamina. Rise of Ronin doesn't have a system like that and it's very, very generous with how big your inventory is. You can fit like 2,000 items in your inventory as you go on. Awesome. So you should be picking up absolutely everything everything in this game, whether you need it or not, or whether you think you need it, because even if it's a worse weapon than you currently have, there's no point discarding it because you can always go back to your home base or go to a city to either sell that stuff or dissemble the, it for materials. Mm. And late in the game, you might just think you're getting a load of crap loot, but you can dissemble all of them, for instance, and then buff the loot you actually like. So there's no downsides to picking stuff up. You might as well be tapping that R1 button every single time you come across an enemy body or anything out in the open world. It just, you will be rich and you <laughs> will be full of resources by the end of it. I feel like as a populist, we need to get more used to using items and using inventory <laughs> space. It's like the, the the decade of the, or the era of the hoarder, saving your potions till the end of the game, saving your items is over. Don't Use get everything. me wrong. <laughs> I need to take my own advice. I still had so many items I hadn't used towards the end of this game and I should have just sold them, man. <laughs> just buff it all up. 
Number nine, there are unmarked secret bosses. So maybe one of the downsides of Rise of the Ronin is that its open world map UI kind of looks like an Ubisoft game where you get an overwhelming amount of UI prompts and markers and checklists and all of that stuff. And while that does make it very legible, it always means you know where you're going next. It's important to note that the map markers, even when you have fully explored one of the areas, aren't always reflective of everything that's there. This is an open world game after all, and there are a lot of secrets to find. And without spoiling any in particular, a good chunk of secret bosses that are very satisfying to fight and come with their own unique loot. I don't want to spend too much time in this because I am veering into spoiler territory and I want you to find these things for yourself, but definitely go off the beaten path. And even if there isn't an icon, you might be able to find something, whether it's a whole new encounter, whether it's a chest, just keep your eyes peeled is all I'll say on that one. Interesting. Number eight, talk to everyone to unlock more side missions and increase bonds. Scott Tilford, I hate talking to people. <laughs> and if someone rings my phone, it will be thrown in oh, the phone sea. Calls suck. It's so just, it's, no. it's, it's difficult for me to take this advice, but I had to in Rise of the Ronin because uh. so much of the RPG systems in this game revolve around the bond system. I don't know how much of that you've um, interacted with so far, but not too essentially, much. Um, as you go through the game, you'll be creating bonds, not just with people but entire areas and what that means in practice is the more you get to know someone the more affinity you gain with them the more rewards you get in the game from them specifically the more they level up to use them as allies in combat mm. but the most important i think is often this bond system is linked to big side missions so there are some that will be locked until you increase your bond with certain characters. So you should be talking to everyone at every opportunity. You do have a home base in the game where people literally come visit you Hang for out. a nice natter and a nice cup of tea. And every time you go back to that home base, talk to everyone that is there, even if you're not maybe a fan of them or even if they're part of a faction that you don't belong to, there's no harm in it. And mm -hmm. it will mean that when you get further into the game, you will have those, um, you'll have those quests already unlocked and ready to go rather than then having to track down the characters, give them a gift, talk to them then. It's just worth doing every time you go back to the checkpoint to check in. Number seven, build around your allies' equipment. Scott, I was just talking to you there about the sort of ally system in this game. If you can increase your bond with people, that means when you take them out on missions, if you choose to do so, mm -hmm. they'll be better equipped, they'll have higher stats, they'll be able to aid you way more. But it's also important to note that when you take these allies out on Ronin missions, they'll also have their own weapons, they'll have their own ranged items. Okay. And because of that, it makes sense because you can swap between these characters at will. Don't just take the exact same equipment that they are taking into battle because you might be taking in a rifle, they might have a rifle, and yeah, that's gonna make for some powerful headshots I against like those a rifle bosses, squad. like I mentioned earlier on, but it's gonna be way better if, say, you bring in a six shooter because if you shoot them while they're attacking, you can do more key damage mm. and, and stuff like that. So it always pays off to be mindful what they're bringing into encounters because it means that you will always, or you should always have a weapon that has an advantage against whoever you're coming with, and you always have a ranged option that can make the most of any situation, whether that's someone who can parry those attacks, like I said, or someone who you can swap to to hang back and then pezzle them with arrow fire. <laughs> there is there are so many options in this game, and I think it, it's very easy to just focus on your character mm. and your build, but when you're in those Ronin missions with one or two other allies, it always makes sense to think a little bit more tactically. How many um, allies can you have with you at once? You can have two with cool. you at once. A triple pronged attack. It's triple pronged attack. And that's if you're not playing co-op and inviting real people in mm. who will of course bring their own items and high level gear as well. Number six, you can spec towards complete solo play. I just talked about allies there, Scott. Suck them off. And you know how I hate talking to people. I also <laughs> don't like just being with people in general. <laughs> Apart from you, I love just being me and you with in this you room. every single day. 
thank you. Um, and that also transfers over to my video games. You can play Rise of the Ronin in co-op for the main missions. You can invite people in, join other people's games, and you can use the AI allies like I've already mentioned to give you that bit of an edge. But you don't have to. For every Ronin mission, you can completely sack off the ally system and go in solo. Now this is explained to you, but to offset the obvious disadvantage you might have by not having two people by your side aggroing and attacking enemies, you can spec your build towards solo play. Mm -hmm. A lot of the gear in the game comes with individual stats that are, you know, unique to those weapons and those armor sets. And a lot of them will say things like plus 12% damage in solo play. And that applies for these Ronin missions if you want to take them on alone. So you might cool. just want to sack everything off, go in with the most default stats ever and, and see if you can overcome the challenge. But if you want to play solo and don't want to be punished for it, you can spec towards that by focusing on gear that buffs your attacks in that mode. And I think that's just worth noting because sometimes the camera goes absolutely wild when you have more than one person on these missions, especially if you're in tighter spaces. Mm. And sometimes you kind of just want to go solo so you're not getting killed off screen because two of your allies are blocking your path. <laughs> I want to channel the spirit of Tenchu at every available second, so I'll be doing that every now and then. Number five, don't ignore gold-colored activities. This is just a quick one. Mm -hmm. All the way through the game, you will get exclamation points that pop up on the map that signify there's a person in need or there's a repeated activity to do nearby. And while I would still encourage you to do a lot of these as it can really help upgrade your weapon proficiency or mm -hmm. get you some rewards, the ones you absolutely should not ignore if you're going to ignore any of them are the ones that are in gold because if it's in gold, it'll mean that, yeah, it might start off as just what looks like a basic side activity, but that can completely snowball into a brand new main side mission, maybe an entire new story segment where you're following an arc over one, two, or three side missions. So yeah. don't ignore those ones. You will get more than one chance to um, encounter them if mm -hmm. you skip it the first time. So don't worry about them, but make sure you prioritize them because they will pop up repeatedly as the game goes on. Number four, don't forget to cash in side activities. Speaking of side activities, mm. Scout, as I mentioned in the review, there are so many cats to pet in this game. There are so One many- One of the first things I did. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, why wouldn't you? What sicko wouldn't you want to pet the cats? <laughs> All the dogs, which I'll get to you later. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's so many cats to pet. There's so many shrines to pray at. There's so many bounties to wipe off the map. But it's important to remember when you're doing all of that stuff, it's not just about the rewards you get in the moment. So when you clear out a bandit camp mm. with a bounty within it, it's not just about the loot you might get from that bounty because all of these activities are usually tied to a specific person. So when you've done a good chunk of them, maybe when you play for a couple of hours, you should always be returning to the person who sent you on that quest mm. to begin with, whether that's the person who sent you out to find the cats or the person who sent you out to hunt down these bounties because they have their own unique rewards for cashing those things in and they essentially work as tokens. So if you're constantly returning to them, you can get high level gear. And more yeah. importantly, they sell specific stat boosts. So the bounties are linked with the strength stats. So you can return and you will be able to buy um, items that buff your strength stat as a whole, which is really essential later on in the game for unlocking specific um, parts of the upgrade tree that are locked behind um, having specific amounts of strength tokens to spend as opposed to regular XP tokens. It's cool. a little bit confusing, but always worth checking back in. Yeah, man. As someone who does try to do as many map markers as possible in a linear fashion, and never goes back anywhere. <laughs> I'll need to take special uh, note of this. Number three, environmental attacks are more powerful than they appear. A little bit like the ranged attacks for bosses, there are so many opportunities for you to use the right trigger and grapple 
a piece of the environment and send it hurling at enemies, whether they be regular enemies or sub-bosses. And you might think that might just be an early game tactic, but this remains OP for pretty much the entire <laughs> game. Whether you're on the hardest difficulty fighting people slightly above your level, if you see something in the environment and you have the window to grab it and throw it at the enemy, always do, because it normally impacts their key massively, if not their health, and it can just make the difference between losing a fight and winning it. If you see three or four red barrels, <laughs> chuck them all at once and you'll set that bad boy on fire and you'll massively eat into their health and it'll leave them open up, open for attacks. I'm it'll loving leave. the return of the red barrels. That was such a thing for so long and we all used to point it out in old games and it went away for a while and I love Rise of the Ronin come. Red barrels, guys. I'll tell you what, Dragon's Dogma has a lot of red barrels in as well. <laughs> red barrels back. are back, baby. <laughs> Number two, match armor sets and transfer stat bonuses. Scott, the armor sets in this game yes. are absolutely fantastic. Just visually. Just looking gorgeous. They look amazing. It kind of reminds me, and this is a strange comparison, but bear with me, of Gotham Knights. I was going to say, hey, Gotham hey, Knights. There he is. So now the, the best drip since Gotham Knights, the best Raz, I believe they're saying well, out there. yeah, close enough. I, I hear I'll words online. I don't no. Arms. It's really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. It's absolutely visually amazing what they've pulled off, the amount of different designs in this game. And even better, they have a transmog system in right. here, right? Which means that if you have a bit of gear with amazing stats, but you hate the look of, it doesn't matter because as long as you've had a piece of clothing or a weapon in your inventory, even if you haven't used it, you can go into the system and make the currently equipped piece of armor or currently equipped weapon weapon look like anything you've previously encountered, which is amazing. But that's not what I'm that. talking about today. What I'm talking about right now is the armor system in general, because of course, as you're going through the game, you're going to be getting rewards and you're going to be getting armor that has higher stats than you would previously have had. But within those stats, there's also a subsection of other stat boosts that can be tied to specific armor sets. So you might have the Silent Assassin set, for instance, and if you collect all of those items, those being the headgear, the armor chest plate, the leggings, the headband or whatever it is, mm -hmm. if you wear all of the set, you can unlock different stat boosts, the more pieces of that clothing that you have. And some of those are really good. Some of those can be major, again, increases to your strength. They can massively increase your parrying time or your stamina or anything like that. And it's worth pressing triangle on these pieces just to see what extras they'll be able to give you if you do want to match them up. Some of them will be worth your time. Some of them you won't mind discarding for another the piece of armor that might have better base stats because you're not getting much from the bonuses anyway. But the point is there are a lot of layers to the stat system in this game rather than just the big number that appears when you pick something up. Can you transmog the um, set bonuses as well? You, thank you for asking. Hey, what hey. a delicious segue. The set bonuses you can't transmog, but right. if you have, say, a 250 damage katana, and that katana is a rare one, that will often come with probably four of its own um, stat boosts tied to that specific weapon mm -hmm. rather than just the set in general. So it, yeah, it might give oh, you- Oh, that'll transfer, yeah. It might give you plus 12% solo damage, like I mentioned earlier. And you can do something with the blacksmith where you can transfer that specific stat to your new weapon, but it will destroy the old weapon and you'll lose the other stat boost that it might have. So you can only choose one to transfer, but it's still absolutely worth doing that if you have a new weapon, but you were kind of attached to an old one because it had this very specific thing that helped your build. Don't worry, you can spend a little coin, you can spend some resources and get that on your new one at the cost of your previous weapon. Delicious. Number one, pet every dog you come across. This is just good just advice life. for life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, just pet every dog you come across, but specifically do it in Rise of the Ronin because there's a whole system tied to cats and dogs in this game, Scott. When okay. you go back to your home base, you can send a dog out with a specific amount of money to <laughs> visit shrines, which then turn up in other people's games, which is just incredible. So cool. You can also send the cats on missions <laughs> to bring you back loot, but those are things that are signposted. What kind of isn't is how if you see someone else's dog in your game, you should be petting that bad boy one 
because the good boy deserves it for being mm -hmm. on a mission, and two, because it's an easy way to acquire a resource that you can spend on new gear or stat boosts or whatever it is you want. It takes five seconds, it costs you nothing, <laughs> and yes, it's not the most important tip and trick in the game, but I am including it as number one because, like you said, just good life advice, just isn't good it? Stuff. It reminds me a little bit of Dragon's Dogma's pawn system as well. Just yes. hang out with other players, um, people who've been sent into other games. You also you always get rewards. You've uh, pointed out something brilliant there Thank as you. well, because yes, there are also, um, like I said earlier, the avatars of other players in the game as well. And if you fight them, you'll also unlock new fighting stances, or you'll get a big chunk of weapon proficiency. It is very, very good. And one final tip and trick. This is a little present from me to the animal lovers out there. Early on, when you're fighting dogs and you're fighting wolves and you're fighting boars, you might think, what have these good guys ever done to me? I don't want to be chopping their arms and legs. They jumped me on the road. That's no bad animals. I'm going to kill them. Just the bad owners, and we'll be we'll behead those in the game <laughs> anyway. But fortunately, you can get an unlock in the skill tree. That means if you can sneak up and assassinate one of these animals, you won't actually kill them. Instead, you'll give them a nice little pat, and then they'll join you as a companion for what? that fight, so you don't even have to kill the animals in the game if you don't want to. Can I get, like, a little a little boar army? You, well, you can. You actually army. can. You can get, like, a big boar army. Oh, mate. Feral hogs on your tail. <laughs> the hogs of war have returned in 2024. <laughs> I will take it. Um, yeah, there are many, many layers to Rise of the Run, and you've been playing it for the last couple of weeks or so. Go check out the review. It'll be live by the time this thing goes up, um, and let us know any other tips and tricks that you found as you You've been playing the game down in the comments below. For now, I've been Scott from Oculture.com. I've been Josh from Oculture.com. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll catch you soon. Goodbye.